thank you very much for joining us for this online event, um, a breakthrough treatment for chronic pain and Q&A with Dr. Kazra Amardelfin. My name is Dane Johnson and I'm a member of Nevro's team here in California. We are hosting the presentation today and are the manufacturer of a chronic pain treatment option called HF10 spinal cord stimulation, which will be part of today's discussion. Today, Dr. Amardelfin will share an overview of chronic pain treatment options and spend time answering important questions from you, our audience. You can submit your questions at any time by clicking the question icon in the bottom of the Zoom browser. All general questions related to the presentation and procedures discussed are encouraged and welcomed. We will address as many as possible at the end of the presentation. For questions that are specific to your unique history, we recommend you um, work with a, your specific physician to have those questions answered. Um, with that, I, I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Amber Delphin, our expert speaker for the day. Next slide, please. So Dr. Amber Delphin is a world-renowned pain management expert specializing in interventional pain management and neuromodulation. He practices in Northern California, where he is the department chair of pain medicine at John Muir Medical Center. Dr. Amber Delphin is an advisor and collaborator with multiple medical device companies. He has published more than 45 scientific papers and stays very active in clinical research. Finally, he is also one of the most caring and patient-centric physicians I have met in my career. Dr. Amber Delphin, with that, um, thank you very much and why don't you take it from here? Dane, thank you so much for that warm introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. First and foremost, I want to tell you that I'm very respectful of your time. And this presentation will not be any longer than about 20 minutes or so. And we'll have plenty of time to answer any question you may have at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions, please enter it into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Uh, my name is Cass Amir Delphin. I've been practicing just outside of San Francisco uh, in, a, in a town called Walnut Creek for the past 20 years or so. And for the last 15 years, I've been involved in a lot of groundbreaking research in the field of chronic pain management. I'm proud to have published more than 48 publications, and I've been involved in developing new technologies in order to treat chronic pain, not only for my own clinical patients in my practice, but also for patients around the world. As all of you may know, chronic pain is a very difficult problem. It's very challenging to treat it. And at the end of the day, we still don't have a cure for chronic pain. One of the reasons why we're having this webinar is because spinal cord stimulation is by far one of the most effective and one of the best studied devices out there to treat chronic pain for those patients who may be candidates for this type of therapy. But because of the fact that chronic pain is so challenging to treat, when we have a success story, we can't share to them, we can't wait to share it with everybody in the world. In fact, next slide, please. I want to start my presentation with one of our patients named Jerry. Jerry is a very sweet lady who's been suffering from low back and leg pain for a very long time. Her pain started when she was a young woman and it just progressively got worse because she had extensive scoliosis and other conditions in her back that caused this pain for her. Jerry was in constant pain and pretty much housebound and she really couldn't anything. And she's a very motivated individual. She had to take pain medicine in order for her to be able to get around, and she hated that. She wanted to find something that could not only control her pain, but she wanted to be able to increase her function and enjoy what she had remained, um, what she had remaining in her life, and most importantly, get off the medications altogether. Next slide, please. So with spinal cord stimulation, specifically with HF10 therapy, we were able to do this for her, and her pain relief has been really remarkable. She's had over 98% pain relief with this, with this device. And in fact, I don't really see her in my practice anymore because she's traveling all around the world. And she, she sent us this picture from her granddaughter's wedding in Jamaica. This is the kind of success story I'd love to see in every single one of my patients, but that's not the case. You know, we, we hope to be able to get somewhere over 50% pain relief in all of our patients with whatever modality we choose, but these are the kind of stories that keep us going and makes us go back to work and be motivated to create better therapies for our patients. Next slide, please. Before I get to spinal cord stimulation, I need to paint a picture of what chronic pain is for every single one of you. Chronic pain is, is a very difficult problem. And as I said before, it's a very challenging issue to treat. 
chronic pain persists for several months or even years. And this is despite appropriate treatment and natural therapies for the patients. Sometimes patients may have spinal disease and they may have undergone appropriate surgery by some of, some of the best surgeons in the world. And despite the fact that the surgery may have been technically successful, the patients continue to have persistent low back and leg pain, which can be problematic and it can hinder their function. But pain among individuals can be very different. It has to do with genetics. It has to do with the disease process. It has to do with the sensitization with pain, cultural be beliefs and upbringing as well. So two individuals which may have similar illnesses or similar injuries may have completely different pain presentations to a physician even and even to their loved ones. There are different types of pain. The two types of pain, main types of pain is mechanical pain and nerve pain. Mechanical pain uh, is also called nociceptive pain. This is the kind of pain that you feel in your knees and in your hips with arthritic changes. In fact, nowadays, as I'm getting older, early in the morning when I get up, the first thing I feel is some pain in my knee. That's mechanical or nociceptive pain. There's also nerve pain or called neuropathic pain. Nerve pain is very different. It's the kind of jolting electricity burning type pain that the patients may feel. The best analogy for that is when you touch a hot stove or a hot iron, the first thing that you do is you pull your fingers back and you start to feel that burning sensation at your fingertips as the tips may bl blister. That burning pain that you feel at your fingertips is neuropathic pain or nerve pain. And a lot of chronic pain patients have a mix of both. Next slide. So nerve pain is the result of damaged and malfunctioning nerve fibers that send the wrong signal to the brain. So the problem may have gone away, just like I explained right now. You know, the patient may have had spinal disease or a herniated disc or something, and they may have gone and seen their, seen their spine surgeon, and the spine surgeon has done the best surgery possible but, and has been technically successful. But the, nerve, the nerves and the nerve signals that go to the brain continue to send the wrong signal to the brain that that area continues to be in pain and it may be damaged. With nerve pain, it's generally it's a lot harder to identify the source. And the stronger the, um, the nerve signal, the stronger the pain for the patients. It may come from illness or injury or no identifiable source at all. In fact, we see a lot of patients in our practice and they come and see us and they say, Dr. Amri Dolphin, I just wanna know where my pain is coming from. Can you please help me find out? And frankly, more often than not, we can investigate it but we can't figure out where the pain is exactly coming from. This is why it's so difficult to manage chronic pain. And pain is incredibly complex. It not only has the physical component that every single one of us knows about, but there's a mental and emotional component associated with it as well. In fact, over the last 20 years, I've treated thousands of patients. And I can confidently tell every single one of you that over 80% of my patients suffer from some mental frustration, depression, or anxiety because of their pain. Next slide, please. So when I'm talking to colleagues who don't understand pain management, or I'm talking to my friends or family members who really don't understand what it is that I do, you know, I basically explain it like this. I tell them, look, I treat patients who have chronic pain that has been there for a prolonged period of time, and they usually don't have a cure. They come to see me because they want their pain to get better. They want their quality of life to improve and they want their function to get better than where it is at this point. And we have simple things that we start with, the conservative measures, and we get more and more aggressive and more invasive with the procedures that we do in order to be able to get to an end point of significant pain relief, improvement in quality of life and improvement in the patient's function. So the first line of therapy for all of our patients is physical therapy and exercise. Physical therapy and exercise has been proven time and time again to be the cornerstone of everything that we do. If the patients exercise, they can themselves increase their function. But the problem is a lot of chronic pain patients can't really exercise because as they engage into exercise, the pain worsens and they stop doing the things that they do. So they need something else to help them get there. Lifestyle changes are really important. If a worker has to do a lot of heavy lifting and bending and stooping, and he, he or she suffers from low back pain, well, maybe they need to think about a different type of a vocation or a job that doesn't have that, those kind of burdens on them so they can alleviate some of the pain on their lower back. If a runner has a lot of pain in their back and legs because they're running and they're causing this kind of jarring motion on their spine, 
well, maybe they need to stop running and engage in swimming or cycling in order to be able to alleviate some of that damage and some of the jarring motion on their low back and on their spine. Next is pharmacological therapy. You know, everybody thinks of pain management doctors as the doctors who prescribe opioid analgesics. But over the last few years, we've gotten away completely from opioid analgesics. This is mainly because of the fact that we know now that opioid analgesics cause a lot of side effects. Long-term, they cause physical dependence, and they're not the right therapy for our patients. There are certain patients that can't live without them, and a small dose of opioid analgesics in a limited period of time is absolutely appropriate. So we do have patients who take low doses and smaller amounts of opioid analgesics than ever before. In fact, in my practice, over the past year, I haven't prescribed a single opioid analgesic for any patient who didn't come to my practice taking those types of medicines because of the fact that we just don't have a lot of scientific evidence for it. Outside of that, there's antidepressants, membrane stabilizing medications, non steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines, which are usually and very commonly engaged and used for the patients in any pain practice around the United States. The second line of therapy, things like our nerve blocks, epidural steroid injections, some of you may have had some of these things, and also nerve ablation, which is the cautery of the very small nerves that may go into a specific area to alleviate the pain in that area. And the last row is are things that are a little bit more surgical and a little bit more involved. Pain pumps are pumps that we can implant inside the abdomen, run a catheter next to the spinal cord, and infuse very small amounts of medicine right next to the spinal cord in order to control the patient's pain. Surgery may be an indication for certain patients. There are times that we really just can't control the pain and surgery may be necessary in, our, in order for the patients to be able to get some relief and get back to their quality of life that they expect. Last but not least, it's what's near and dear to my heart, spinal cord stimulation, because it's my area of expertise since I've been doing uh, the research in it over the past 15 years. And specifically, HF10 therapy, which is a type of spinal cord stimulation, which we're going to talk about with a lot more detail in the next few slides. Next slide, please. So spinal cord stimulation is a very established and safe therapy that involves the delivery of energy to the spinal cord and the neurons in the pain pathway itself. SCS delivers very small electrical impulses to the pain sensing pathways within the spinal cord itself. This effectively, effectively alters the pain signal from getting to the brain. So roughly speaking, it's kind of like when you hit your funny bone and you use your hand to rub the funny bone area. And the tactile sensation, the touch itself, distracts the pain signal from going to the brain. Now imagine a very sophisticated system within the body that distracts the pain signal from the chronic pain area to get to the brain. And that in and of itself can be very effective in alleviating a significant portion of our patient's pain. Spinal cord stimulation or SCS is nothing new. It's been around since the 1970s. In fact, the very first spinal cord stimulator was implanted in 1967, and it became commercially available here in the United States in the early 1970s. And every few years, we've seen new iterations, new technologies, and new devices that can potentially control our patient's pain far better than the last generation before that. SCS is typically prescribed for the treatment of pain in the trunk, low back, or limbs, which includes the arms as well. Next slide, please. HF10 happens to be one of the most advanced SCS therapies available out there. We call it HF10 or HF10 therapy, and after 12 years of research and development here in the United States, the FDA approved it in 2015 for commercial use here in on all around the country. It's highly effective for both low back and leg pain, not to mention other areas. And in controlled scientific trials, the success rate was nearly 80% for 12 months. And I'm, I've had the honor of being involved in some of these studies, and I've had patients who are far beyond 12 months who continue to get significant pain relief with these devices. These devices are not temporary measures. They're long-term measures to be able to control the patient's pain for a prolonged period of time. This particular device doesn't have any tingling associated with it or paresthesias. So it's, it's actually labeled by the FDA to be paresthesia-free. All the traditional devices before HF10 and most of the devices on the market at this point cause a pleasant tingling sensation across the back and into the legs, which can potentially mask the pain signal from going to the brain. It sounds really good, 
But the problem with it is that over a prolonged period of time, that tingling can get annoying for the patients. And as the patients move back and forth, that tingling may become a jolt or a shock, which we call a positional effect. So the patients tend to turn the amplitude of the device down and make it subtherapeutic, and it's just not effective for them anymore. So because of that, the tingling is not always a welcome change for the patients. This device doesn't have any tingling associated with it at all. And in fact, the FDA has labeled it to be paresthesia free. Aside from that, the FDA has also given it conditional approval for full body MRI. That means that any patient who has this device implanted can get an MRI on any part of their body as long as the MRI center makes some minor changes in their MRI machine in order to, for, for them to be able to get this done. There's a rechargeable battery in it, and the battery needs to be charged for about 30 to 45 minutes every day. And, but it's not really a big deal for any of the patients because the charging belt is a, is a wireless charging belt that the patients put on and they can sit down and watch the news, for example, while they charge their, their device, or they can drive while they're charging their device because this is the only device on the market that has actually been labeled to be appropriate for driving or operating machinery out there as well. The, the charging device is incredibly convenient. The commuting story that I just told you is actually one of my patients who has a 30 minute commute to work. So in the mornings, he takes the charging belt, he puts it on around his waist. By the time he gets to work, his device is charged. He puts the belt in the trunk and he goes to work. And that's his routine and that's the way he charges his, his device. The battery itself has a 10 plus year battery life. We know that it'll last for at least 10 years and maybe even more. And once the battery expires, we just go back in and within a 15 to 20 minute minor procedure, we can change the battery for the device. Next slide. So there are a lot of common questions that come up about this device, HFN therapy and spinal cord stimulation altogether. So let's go through some of these common questions and see if we can answer any of them. But don't forget, if you have any questions yourself, please enter them into the Q&A panel and we'll get to them at the very end. So how does the procedure work? Well, first of all, as I evaluate the patient, I need to determine whether they're a good candidate for spinal cord stimulation to start. If they are a good candidate, the patients get to test drive the system. They get to try the system first to see if they like it or not. And the trial is incredibly easy. You take the patient into the operating room, you put a couple of very small needles in, put the leads in place through the needles, take the needles out, put a dressing on the patient's back and bring the wires around and connect it to an outside generator uh, that the patients will use for about five to seven days to test the device. That's only the trial. If the trial is successful, at the end of it, we pull the leads out here just in the office and uh, we move on to a permanent implant a few weeks right after that. If the trial isn't successful, the patient hasn't lost much. We pull the leads out and we're done. It takes me about 15 minutes to put the leads in, and the way the leads go in is basically with needles, just like an epidural injection, they go right into the spine, just like that under x-ray. It's an incredibly safe procedure, and it doesn't take me more than about 15 minutes to do it, and that's pretty much the case across the board for good implanting physicians who do spinal cord stimulation around the country as well. If the trial is successful, at the end of the trial, it takes me three seconds to pull them out, then we move on to a permanent implant. The permanent implant itself takes about 45 minutes to do because there's some minor surgery involved to make a pocket under the skin for us to implant the entire device under the skin. This is an example of one of the devices. As you can see, it's actually quite small. It's no bigger than a heart pacemaker. I can use my hand next to it as a comparison of how small it is and how thin it is. And this device is, is actually good for about 10 years right there. So this is the device that gets implanted. And as you can see, there are leads right here and the leads go in and they get implanted under the skin as well. Second question, is it safe? Absolutely, it's safe. HFN is, is probably one of the safest um, uh, therapies out there as is spinal cord stimulation altogether. Um, in fact, the two things that we worry about with any surgery is bleeding and infection. And this has been studied time and time again within our scientific literature. And we know that the infection rate is, is less than one to 3% based on the studies that you read. So only one out of every 100 or no more than three out of every 100 patients are at risk of getting an infection. So the risks are very, very small. 
we are putting devices next to the spinal cord. There's always a risk of nerve root damage and spinal cord damage as well, but the risk for such problems is even less than bleeding and infection. In fact, if you need any more information about the safety of the device and whether there are any side effects with it, there's a lot of information on the website hf10.com and you can see the address right down there, www.hf10.com forward slash safety and you can read all about it. But, the, the, but suffice it to say that uh, the side effect rate is really minor and, and overall it's a very, very safe therapy. Next question, will I feel anything? Well, I just mentioned that this device is paresthesia free and it's been labeled by the FDA as being paresthesia free. So there is no tingling associated with it. You turn the device on and the pain slowly gets better. You turn the device off and the pain slowly comes back. If you want tingling for any reason, or if a patient wants tingling for any reason, just because of the fact that they feel like they need it for certain times, certain indications, certain conditions, this same device can provide all the traditional frequencies and the traditional um, treatments as well, aside from HF10 therapy. But this is the only device on the market that provides HF10 therapy along with everything else. So HF10 therapy is exclusive to the devices manufactured by this company called Nevro. Uh, next slide, please. Is the trial procedure reversible? 100%. I tell all my patients that you have nothing to lose by trying it. If you have any doubt in your mind that if this is gonna work for you, if this is indicated for the patients, I tell them, move forward and get the trial done. And you will know at the end of the trial if this is the right thing for you or not. Some patients ask me, well, what's your success rate? How many patients who actually try this device move forward to get the implant? And I tell them very easily because I keep count on all of these things that nine out of 10 patients in my practice who have low back and leg pain move forward with a permanent implant after they've tried it. So my success rate, my trial to permanent ratio is actually 90%. In the large study that this manufacturer did along with 11 investigation sites around the country and over 200 patients 88% of the patients who tried the device move forward and obtain the permanent implant. Can I turn off the device if I need to? No worries, no problem at all. In fact, every single patient gets the remote control, kind of like a remote control for the television. They have, the remote control has an on and off button. The patients can turn it off or turn it on any time they like. They can reduce or increase the amplitude if they like, just like you'd reduce or increase the amplitude uh, uh, of the volume, I'm sorry, of a, of a television. Or you can choose from different channels like a remote control. So there are several different programs that every patient can choose from depending on their pain and the kind of presentation they have on that day. So the patients have full control of the device. They can use it at any time they want and they can turn it off at any time they want. Can I have an MRI? with this? And the answer is yes, absolutely. This device has conditional MRI approval from the get-go and every single patient who's been implanted with these devices can get an MRI as long as the MRI center makes some very small adjustments on their MRI machine for it to get done. And there's also more information on hf10.com about the MRI compatibility of the device. Next slide. So you may be wondering how I'm doing in my own practice with my patients. As I said, I'm a practicing physician. Despite the fact that I like to do research, my day job is to treat patients uh, in my practice in suburbia, Bay Area. And um, so this is just a snapshot of how my patients are doing. There's a 44% reduction in medication usage in my patients with HF10 therapy. And I couldn't be any more proud of that. The fact that the patients are taking less medicine, the fact that they have less side effects, the fact that they don't have to depend on taking pills like this is a success in and of itself. 58% of my patients reported improvement in their sleep. That's huge. If the patients are sleeping better at night, they can function better during the day and they can enjoy a better quality of life. Guess what? 99% of my patients keep their device on 24 hours a day, seven days a week because pain doesn't stop at night and this device does not have any tingling associated with it, or there's no shocking with it. So there's no reason for them to turn it off. They keep it on through the night, they sleep better at night, and they have a better day the next day. There's a 71% improvement in the patient's function. That I've achieved my goal with this. The patients are reducing their medicine, they're sleeping better, they're having a better quality of life, and they've been able to improve their function. 
and 68% of my patients have had long-term pain relief. As I mentioned earlier, I had the honor of being involved in the randomized control trial that got uh, this device, its FDA approval here in the United States. Those patients are now out over eight years in my practice and every single one of them continues to get significant pain relief from their devices. And they're very grateful to have been some of the first people to not only study this with us, but to also get the kind of pain relief that they've gotten. And I'm very grateful to them as well. Next slide, please. So I started with one of my good patients. I'm ending with one of my good patients as well. This is Chris. He was implanted in 2019. As you can see, he's 71 years old and you can look at the background and you can tell that he really loves sailing. He's, get, he's getting about 80% pain relief in, in his low back and legs and he's been able to get back to the kind of things that he likes to do as he's retired from his work. He wants to sail all around the Bay Area and even outside of the Bay Area along with his wife. So he couldn't be any happier and I'm so pleased to have been able to give him that opportunity for him to get there. Next slide. So you may be wondering how things are happening in the era of COVID-19 and this pandemic. Well, our first and top priority for all the patients and all of our employees is to keep them safe. So we have these common safety protocols in place. A lot of us, not just me in this practice, but a lot of physicians across the country, I would say 99.9% .9 of the patients across the country are now doing telemedicine appointments when appropriate. They have safety protocols in place in order to make sure that the patients are not exposed to anything that they're not supposed to expose to. Pre-screening phone calls are take place. Masks are required as the patients enter the office. They do temperature checks at entry into the office. There's a patient screening questionnaire at check-in in order to make sure that the patient is safe and everybody else in that office is safe as well. There's reduced waiting room seating capacity. In fact, we've taken a lot of the chairs out of our waiting room and there's a six foot distance between each chair. So not that we have that many people coming into the office nowadays because almost all of our um, uh, visits are via telemedicine and video conferencing. And if the patients choose to, they can sit in the car and wait until their, their, their turn and then they can receive a text message and they can just step in and go in and see the physician in the exam room. You may also be wondering about surgery centers and hospitals. Surgery centers and hospitals are actually the epicenter of safety at this point. They've implemented some significant protocols in order to ensure the patient's safety and everyone else's safety as well. So um, rest assured that this is a very important topic and every single measure has been taken in order to ensure everyone's safety so you can continue to get the care that you need. Next slide. So the next steps is that in the next couple of weeks, you may get a, a call from the HF10 concierge team and uh, they will be able to answer any specific questions you may have. And if you choose to go and see a provider in your area, they can locate a provider for you. That number that will show up on your phone is 1-800-387-2381. You may wanna take a picture of this slide at this point and put that phone number in your phone so that you don't think it's spam or it doesn't show up as, as spam when they call you to speak to you about this. If you want any more information, the hf10.com website is really good. A lot of my patients have complimented this website because it provides a plethora of information on spinal cord stimulation and HF10 therapy specifically, so you can become more knowledgeable about it even before you go to see your physician about it. Please recall that many providers are offering the options for telemedicine if you don't feel comfortable going in and seeing your physician in person. Next slide, please. This is the front page of the hf10.com website. I really liked it, so I actually put it on my last slide. It really is um, a, a wealth of information on spinal cord stimulation, on all the things that you can expect. I really encourage all of you to just go on this website and look around and get your answers, uh, get your questions answered. And when you go to see your physician, if you, like, if you choose to do so, you will be a far more educated patient about spinal cord stimulation altogether. So I just wanna thank everyone for joining me. That's the end of my presentation. And Dane has come back on and he's been going through the questions and I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have at this point. Don't forget, you can answer your questions at the, in the Q&A panel in the bottom of your screen. Dane, what's my first question? 
Well, thank you very much for that informative um, presentation, Dr. Merelfin. So, um, as always, the first question is always, um, will this be covered by my insurance? Can you please share a little bit of information about um, um, typical coverage? Yeah, that's a very common question and an excellent one. Spinal cord stimulation has been around for a long time. It's been proven scientifically and medically to be one of the best things that we do. So all insurances, including Medicare, cover this device here in the United States. So there's no problem with that whatsoever. Great. So our next question is from someone from, some, from someone named Mike, and he asked, um, during the permanent implant procedure, does any trimming of the spinal bones um, need to be performed to support that implantation? Another good question, and the simple answer is no. The, the, the leads that we implant are cylindrical leads, and they're quite small. And I can show this again, and you can see, you can see it better right down here and see how, how big they are. They're no bigger than the inside of a pen, basically. So you use needles to put them to go right into the epidural space and implant these leads right inside the spine itself over the spinal cord. So there's no need to trim any bone at all. Having said that, there are certain patients that require a little bit more advanced type of surgery for this. And those patients are a very small percentage, just no more than 5% of the patient population, where we, they have to go see a spine surgeon or a neurosurgeon, where the neurosurgeon or the spine surgeon simply trims a small portion of the bone in this area right here, just to be able to put a, a bigger paddle right inside the spinal um, uh, column itself in order to be able to give the patient the appropriate spinal cord stimulation. But that is really the only case that this happens. Outside of that, 95% of the cases are done percutaneously and through needles, just the way I showed you. Well, great. Well, we actually do have a couple more questions around the permanent implant procedure. Um, so I'll ask you two at once. Um, one is um, how long, what's the duration of the permanent implant procedure? And then also what's the duration of the recovery time? Both very good questions. So from physician to physician, the duration of the implant procedure may be very different. You know, some, some physicians implanted in about 30 minutes, some patients implanted in about an hour and a half. The average time period is about an hour. In my hands, it takes about 45 minutes to do a very meticulous and clean implant. All of these implants are outpatient. The patients will never have to stay in the hospital. They never have to have general anesthesia with it. For, so there's no tube breathing for you. All the patients are usually breathing on their own. They just get heavier sedation in order for them to be asleep through the procedure, which is yet another big advantage of this. The recovery time is, is actually fairly short. There's some pocket pain because we have to make pockets within the subcutaneous tissue in order for us to implant the battery and also the leads themselves. The pocket pain is a little bit difficult for a day or two, but very quickly the pain starts to dissipate and the patients start to feel better. Within six weeks, the entire device scars right inside the body. So, um, so the patients really don't feel it anymore and it just stays in place for 10 years at a time. Thank you. Um, so we have a, a question from Didi. It's a, it's a follow-up to your question regarding the unique um, um, necessity to trim the bones in some instances. And um, that is, um, does a laminectomy have to be performed and why? So uh, we, a lamin, it's, laminectomy is the wrong term. Laminectomy is when you go in and actually take this entire bone out altogether. What the surgeons do is a, is a process called laminotomy, which is making a small hole right inside the bone because the paddle implants are a little bit wider and they need to be implanted visually. So they make a very small hole within the bone itself in order for them to be able to do it in a very meticulous and accurate manner. Uh, it's not a big deal at all. It does not destabilize the spine. And as I said, it's a very small portion of the patients who get paddle implants around the United States. Great. Um, so our next question is, um, is it appropriate to have a CT scan following the implantation of the device? There's absolutely no need to have a CT scan the, following the implantation of the device. The device starts to work right away. If there's ever a need to study something about the device itself, an x-ray may be sufficient. Uh, if the patient does need to get a CT scan for any other reason, they're absolutely welcome to do so. There's no contraindication uh, with having this device and getting a CAT scan, but there's no follow-up CT scan that's necessary after the implantation of a spinal cord stimulator. 
Great. Um, and you mentioned this earlier, but can you describe a little bit what is actually included in the trial phase? Yeah, so the trial is very simple. You know, there's a little bit of a process to get to the trial portion, mainly because of the fact that I need to evaluate the patient. The physician needs to get to know the patient. The patient needs to be educated on what spinal cord stimulation is and whether HFN therapy is actually the right therapy for them. And once that happens, the patients agree to a trial. We get authorization from the insurance company and you know, almost 99% of the time, we do get authorization from all insurance companies, uh, including Medicare. We take the patient to the operating room and under x-ray guidance, uh, we uh, put two small needles right into the subcutaneous tissue and the skin and right inside the spine. Then we run the leads up into the spinal column itself, take the needles out, the leads will be coming out of the skin and they'll be connected to an outside generator, which is no bigger than my iPhone. The patients wear that outside generator uh, like a belt in a fanny pack around their waist, and they use it for about five to seven days. Depending on the physician, the trial period can be different, but five to seven days is very average. On the end of the, the trial, at the end of the trial, the patients go back into their physician and they say, doctor, I feel better. I have significant pain relief. I have improvement in my function. I feel like I can take less medicines, and I'm absolutely sure that I want it. And the patients are the only people who can make that decision. And the physician can evaluate them and agree with them. And then uh, the leads are pulled out in the office within three seconds. It's a very simple process to pull the leads out. We just take the dressing off and I pull the leads out just like this. And we're done. And uh, at that point, we request authorization for the permanent implant and move forward to the permanent Im implant within a few weeks after the trial has been completed. Well, great. Um, so the next question um, asks, um, why do you like this specific device compared to the others that are available? Yeah, excellent question. And I'm really glad that somebody asked this question. So I, despite the fact that I'm a clinician and I treat a lot of patients in my practice, I'm also a scientist. And as I said earlier in this uh, presentation, I've published over 48 publications and scientific manuscripts on um, on not only neuromodulation, but other types of therapies as well. And I'm really proud of that. And I look at the evidence within our peer-reviewed literature in order for me to be able to make the right decision for my patients. I don't listen to marketing rhetoric from the sales reps. I don't listen to rumors. I try to go with the clinical evidence within our uh, literature in order to make the decisions. And this particular device and this particular therapy has been proven in a randomized controlled trial, one of the largest ever done in the history of spinal cord stimulation to be superior to traditional spinal cord stimulators. And this is the reason why I not only choose to use this for my patients, but this would be the device that I would use for my family members as well. Great. Um, so this next question is an interesting one. So if someone were to, to pass away, you know, for instance, of, of old age eventually, um, would the original clinic need to remove this device? No, not at all. There's no need to remove it. Okay, great. Um, so our next question um, is also from Mike. And this um, asks, you know, over the years, um, how has the Nevro product changed and how much has it improved? Yes, so over the years, you know, uh, well, the, the Nevro product has only been around for about five years because uh, the FDA approval came in 2015. But as I said, there was about, 10 or 12 years of research and development to get it to that point. So the, the battery itself used to be a little bit larger and it only provided HFN therapy and that was it. And now the battery has gotten smaller, no more than, no bigger than a small portion of the palm of my hand and a little bit thinner as well. And aside from that, this particular device can not only provide HFN therapy, but it can also provide the low frequency spinal cord stimulation and any other frequency for that matter that has ever been tested and studied in, in humans with the same device. So they've expanded the possibilities with the same device. So there's a lot more options and a lot more versatility that you can get from the same device. Well, great. So we have a couple of questions that are similar. Um, they're about um, functional limitations during not only the trial, but also the permanent implant procedure. So for instance, in the trial, um, you know, sleeping or showering, and then in the permanent implant, more active things like playing tennis or badminton. Yes. 
So good question. So for the trial itself, since the, since the patients have a dressing on their back, I always tell them that it would be better for you not to shower because you have this small dressing on your back. The dressing is usually no bigger than, uh, in my hands, no bigger than two, two palms of my hand like this together. But if the patients have to shower, I tell them they can use a hand, handheld shower and shower in the front without getting that dressing wet. And, and that would keep the device as safe as possible. Remember that it's only five to seven days. Most patients can do it without any problems at all. I've had patients who've taken showers every day with it as long as they've used the shower in the front without getting that dressing wet. They just need to be careful and meticulous. If the dressing gets wet, if the dressing gets compromised, they can always contact their physician and go see their physician as soon as possible in order to make sure that the, the dressing is resecured and the uh, trial has not been um, compromised altogether. So the other thing is the activity. So these leads at the beginning during the trial can be like wet noodles and they can move around a little bit within the spinal column itself. So we ask the patients not to engage in any type of strenuous activity, but we want them to do the things that they do every day in order for them to determine whether this is the right device for them or not. So you're not bedridden. We ask the patients to go out and do all the things that they like to do. Go to the mall and walk around when you can go to a mall and walk around, not during a pandemic. Go outside and garden if you, if you want, if that's something that you like to do. Go out with your grandchildren and see if that's, you know, if you have the same kind of pain that you used to have before. And, and if the patients do all the things that they do, they really can have a calculated comparison between the time without the leads in place for the trial and the times of the trial when the leads are in place and they're active. That's the only way they can make the decision. When we move to a permanent implant, within the first six weeks, we ask the patients to limit their activity. But as I said, this is an outpatient procedure. It doesn't take more than an hour to do. So the patients can go for a walk and go out to dinner on the same day if they choose to do so. They're just gonna have some pain from the pockets that I've made to implant the device. Within a few days, the pocket pain slowly goes away. It takes about six weeks for the entire device to stabilize in place and the patients can engage in any type of activity that they choose to do so without any issues. Tennis is not a problem at all. Golf is not a problem at all. In fact, one of the very first patients I ever implanted with the Nevro device has become a really avid golfer and he plays every weekend and he enters all kinds of tournaments and he's won a few tournaments and he keeps asking me to go out and play with him all the time, but I'm afraid to do that because I'm afraid I'm just gonna embarrass myself. <laughs> Well, that's great. Um, so what about um, if a patient were to need a sequential surgery after having the device, you know, potentially also in the spine, um, is there any limitations to that um, once they've already had the implant? Not at all. Uh, the, only, the only thing that uh, the, the surgeon needs to be aware of is that the device in place, the location of the device, and that's usually determined by a couple of x-rays, so they can avoid damaging it as they're doing the surgery, but there's really no, no issue at all. You know? So um, there's never been a limitation of, of that kind. The only limitation that I can see is that if the surgery was to be done where the leads are actually implanted, but that's incredibly rare. Okay, now here's actually a very important question. So does the device um, improve not only pain relief, provide not only pain relief, but also promote mobility and improvement in function? So the whole reason why we do anything in chronic pain management is to help the patients improve their function. So if I can alleviate a patient's pain, they will naturally function better. That hopefully they'll go out there and enjoy their life more. Hopefully they'll go out there and exercise more, engage in physical therapy more vigorously. So the device itself does not give you an improvement in function, but the device reduces your pain so you can go out there and function better and improve your overall health. Great. Well, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Maybe we'll just field a few more. Um, here's a couple, Dr. Emmerdelfin. So um, is there any adverse effect for um, diabetic patients? None whatsoever. In fact, we just completed a big study with diabetic patients, and uh, we didn't see any additional side effects with those patients, and uh, we saw phenomenal results. And that's a study that we can talk about at future talks. But uh, diabetic patients are just as much candidates as anybody else to, to get the same plan. Great. And what about the typical time before um, a patient can return to work? 
Uh, most, my, most of my patients return to work within three or four days after they implant. I tell them, take the day of the procedure off and take two days off after that just to make sure that you're healing okay and you get your feet under you. And after that, you can just go back to work. Most patients on average go back to work within three days. Great. Um, so there is a question here that I can actually answer. Um, um, a patient had indicated that they called um, a physician several times and did not get um, a response. Um, you know, one of the follow-ups from today um, is we're going to have our patient concierge team who are um, very great educators on this therapy call everyone that attended um, the webinar today. And that person can not only answer any questions you have, but also can connect you with one of our local representatives um, that's associated with your local um, HF10 provider, and they can help you kind of facilitate that contact. Um, so let's see here. I think, I think with that, um, I think we'll conclude. Those were a lot of great questions. I thank everyone um, very much for joining. We really hope you found this um, insightful and potentially will give you a next step towards um, getting better. Dr. Rodolphin, if you'd like to say any closing words, um, please go ahead. Jane, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. I hope this has been informative. Uh, I hope you understand that there's a lot more options out there for chronic pain. Please share this information with your family members. And um, if this is something that you're interested in, go see a doctor in your area and see if this, you would be a good candidate for it or not. And thank you again for joining us. Good night.